good to be here today and praise God today and we're continuing in our series on women uh, Mother's Day series there's three of them um, we fell into that because I messed up and did Mother's Day a week early so we did Mother's Day a week early Mother's Day a week on the week of this and we're gonna do it a week late you know uh, and I my three favorite heroes in the Bible three of my favorite uh, heroes in the Bible uh, Priscilla uh, is one of them and then we had uh, of course we talked about uh, Dorcas which I love that name uh, <laughs> strange uh, Brenda's great grandmother's name was Azula I, I put Dorcas and Azula in that same category uh, you know in the Bible we encounter men a lot and we talk about uh, male theology a lot and I want to dispel some of that this morning. I want to lift women up in a powerful role that they played in the gospel and in the early church. Uh, in the New Testament, a woman named Priscilla spent time with the Apostle Paul. Now, Priscilla was a tent maker. Paul was a tent maker. Lydia was a dyer of purple cloth. Now, I, I forgot to get my prayer cloth, the Jewish prayer cloth that I put on. That is what Paul made. He didn't make tents. Where, where he came from, they didn't have tents. It was a dry air, and same with Priscilla. She came, she was a Jew. How they met is making tents together, making those prayer shawls. That, that prayer shawl has all 613 or whatever it is, laws on the prayer shawl. And the Jews learned them. While they used that prayer shawl, they would hold the cord. That prayer shawl Jesus wore. I believe that was the prayer shawl he was wearing when the woman who was bleeding ran up and touched it. Grabbed the name, hold the name of God, Yahweh, is on that prayer shawl. Paul, Lydia, a dyer of purple cloth, remember her, she brought the dye, and Paul and Priscilla made these cloths. Uh, Priscilla and Aquila were married, and they were friends of Paul's. They were co-workers with Paul, but not only did she work making tents with Paul, but Priscilla preached with Paul. And they would go into the marketplace and she would argue. And she gave good arguments about Jesus Christ. She was no slouch in her arguments. Now, why do they go to the marketplace and argue about Jesus, about God? That's an interesting, maybe way to think about. Maybe, you know, I don't know. That's interesting. Uh, her and her husband lived in, left Italy because the Roman Empire, Claudius, uh, commanded all the Jews to leave. Now, she would have packed up and just left. Uh, the emperor did not become... Uh, uh, there was a Christian raking havoc in, in Rome, and that's why they had to leave. Uh, in 41 AD, Jews couldn't meet in synagogues. Uh, they, were, they had to meet in open air forms. Remember, that's where Lydia was. Priscilla started a church in her house. She ran the church in her house. Her husband was a great orator and a great debater, but his theology stunk. Priscilla is the one that straightened him out. No matter what the case, Priscilla and Quella met Paul in Corinth. In Corinth, if you read the Bible, that was a pretty nasty group of people that she was hooked up with. And uh, she was a light in that community to bring people to Christ. Now, in Corinth, these are Roman slaves who, and, and Jews and so on started this church. And, and so uh, she could identify with them. Apollos could identify with them. Uh, and then she had other, she went to a couple other places. Uh, but the thing I, I, I really found as I searched the scriptures and I read the historical documents, if you read some of the historical documents in the first century that were written about these people, these people... She had immense kindness. She had immense hospitality. She had immense hard work. And uh, I think those three attributes are three attributes to build a church. Kindness, hard work. Uh, it goes to show that a couple in marriage become one. Two different people that supported each other in marriage and support each other in, in the discipline of building the church. They both preached. They both taught. They both were uh, loved by Paul. During the time period, women mainly uh, served as mothers, 
uh, bearing children. Uh, they couldn't own property. Uh, they didn't have much to say in marital matters or politics or in the church. Priscilla did. Paul identifies women in the Bible who all did. Jesus Christ gave women a say in what he, in, in, uh, around him. He lifted women up. That contrasts to the culture of the day, especially the Roman culture of the day. The, pi, the Bible depicts her as an equal. She's an equal. Her work alongside her husband as a tent maker, and the Bible does not focus on whether she produced offspring or house, but that produced her preaching and her teaching. It didn't lift him up. He lifted him up as a great orator. Little Washington, PA was one of my first churches. I was a lay pastor, uh, and they asked me to go down there, and they had uh, 18 people. They had a woman pastor, 350-member church, and they, the church vacated. Everyone left because the presbytery made them put a woman in there. So I went in June, and I was working at the counseling center, and uh, I visited everybody. We had a picnic, and I preached, and 178 people came back. Uh, they had a cemetery fund. They had more money in the cemetery than in the church. Then I went from Little Washington to Masontown, where I met Brenda. And Brenda and I uh, got married, and we went into teaching. But uh, I had started a little licensing ring in Pennsylvania. I had five people. We built uh, Ellen, who was uh, about my mother's age, helped me build that church. But I can tell you, in my ministry at that time, I was lacking in good biblical theology. I had been to three seminaries, and I can tell you it's interesting. I'll just put it that when my mother, when my dad cooked, he burnt everything. And my mother's comment was, well, that's interesting. So if you put interesting in the context of our family dilemma, my theology was interesting. In meeting Brenda and my preaching, and we did were successful in the three churches, of bringing them back to life, five-member church to 111, and uh, your little church, uh, Ada Palmer, and they did well, and we did well there. And we went down to South Carolina, and we've been here. Uh, we love it, loved South Carolina. All our kids were born. But my ministry would be nothing without Brenda. Brenda and I are as different as the sun is from the moon. And uh, she is kind, demure, gentle, sweet, Innocent, we won't go into me. <laughs> you just take it as it is, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but see, that's what God does. And Brenda and I uh, work hand in glove. Uh, when I first met her, uh, I was driving a little Honda Civic, and uh, uh, I was at, I stayed in the manse, and I went home, and all my clothes were missing. I didn't know where they were. And I was going down the road, and I wasn't by her house, and I'm looking out, there's this long laundry list out in the backyard. And I realized that was my clothes hanging in the backyard. Her, she, her mother and her took them home, put them in the washing machine, hung them out back, you know. I guess I was dirty, I don't know. But uh, we, we, re, we remodeled your mother's bathroom. Uh, we have remodeled how many manses, how many churches, and worked... Now we, we're getting too old to do a lot of this work anymore. We're painting doors, but that's, you know, maybe as far as we're going to go. But uh, my theology has grown because of Brenda's understanding of Scripture and the Lord and her gentleness and her constant reminder of what's important. You know, uh, we have uh, children, and this little girl here was a school teacher. South Carolina, Beaufort, we got jobs down there. It was disabled. They fired, and a school district, this one high school, two elementary schools, they fired everybody because they couldn't pass the teacher. That's how we got these jobs. I taught special ed, and she taught third grade. When she taught third grade, the end of the first year was the first year in the history of that school that every kid passed the EOG. She's good. She's good at what she does. Now, she's getting ornery as she gets older. <laughs> Mr. Tyler came here with a bunch of zeros, and now he's the top of his class. You, you, kind of, Brenda's the kind of person that everyone wants to work with, and she's like, you know, I, I just, 
she's there and she's not noticeable as I am. That's Priscilla and Aquila. That's what ministry is about. That's the gifts of this church. You think about, uh, someone laughed and said, well, now you've got to put up with all these women in the elder board. Praise God and hallelujah and thank you for Miss Pat. Come on, Miss Janet. Miss Kathy here has done a fantastic work as Miss Nancy and, and, and Pam. John and I, uh, you know, got, that, this guy here is, is smart and good and it's a good team. It doesn't matter what the women or men, we bring different things to the table. And we all bring a love for Jesus Christ, a knowledge of God, and all different gifts that we need. It's not a, uh, women were lifted up by Paul. Aquila and uh, Priscilla were lifted up by Paul. Paul valued Priscilla, uh, Udaya, uh, Sinchiah, as his co-workers in the gospel ministry of preaching. He preferred uh, Juliana as a follower, a Jew. He preferred her. He commanded Phoebe to the church of Rome as our sister. Every case, everybody. There's one woman he kind of, I think he was in love with. That's okay. He didn't get married, you know, but he was a Paul. When we look at ministry, most women don't work in the ancient world, and yet Priscilla had a ministry of tent making. Most women weren't Priscilla. Other women weren't called by God. God calls Priscilla because he knew the gift she had and the strength she had to do what he wanted her to do. We can see the Bible had rather radical ideas about treatment of women opposed to the Roman culture. How Paul treated them, how uh, Jesus treated them. Under the old covenant, only men could be priests. But gender distinctions have no place in the new creation. This is why so many prominent women are named in the New Testament, and this is why Saul uh, locked them up in, in, in gratitude along with men. He spoke of them as equals, in equally uh, uh, high-minded fashion. Christian women in the first century led from the front. And they got arrested for doing so, and they got to prison for doing so. Read this, the stories of the martyrs. You'll see woman after woman after woman with great strength and great uh, uh, ability. I remember, I, I can't remember her name, but I was reading this, this, the states, and this woman was being tortured, and she was being put on a, a spit over hot coals. And she had a sense of humor. She said, boys, I'm done. Turn me over. <laughs> I don't know. You think today that we have prosperity and we have health because of these people that came before us. You know, I don't know if persecution is a thing of the future, but these people were persecuted and they stood strong for their faith. Can you imagine? I don't know if you can imagine in a Roman world, a woman going to the marketplace and arguing with men and standing her ground and being able to convert people. I mean, think about that. According to John, uh, one of the early uh, uh, historians in the church, the women in the early church were more spirit-minded than lions, he said. Jesus encouraged women to lead, and for a while he, they did. Now, what happened? In 354 AD, the Council of Laodicea banned the appointment of women leaders. And also, uh, the Catholic Church... There was like, I don't know how many translations of the Bible, threw them all out and put everything in Latin so the priest could uh, tell you what to believe. Of course, Martin Luther uh, uh, changed all that, and Wycliffe, you know, and we got the translations everywhere in the Bible. Jesus encouraged his disciples to let their light shine. But after the fourth century, Christian female followers had their gifts hidden under the bushel. The philosophers and rabbis are responsible for some of the worst ideas were inherited about women. As a result of their sexist, uh, many women have been kept silent and sidelined, and the world is poorer for it. There should be no division in the body, the Bible says. No division in the body. There is neither male nor female, for all are one in Christ Jesus. 
Apostle Paul and said to all who have been baptized in Christ are co-heirs to the kingdom. Indeed, it is not the test of our fellowship that we esteem those who would deem weak and womanly while giving greater honor to the parts that lack it? I mean, come on. We who have learned to see through the eyes of Jesus no longer regard anyone as fallen. And if you look at this, uh, uh, we, we have a newsletter out. John does a wonderful job. If you look at this, you look at our, our role in society today, it's to lift people up to a higher plane, to a higher calling. We're all called to Jesus Christ. We all have gifts and abilities, and they're different. And we embrace those differences and use those differences for the gospel. People are going to come in this door. Uh, and they're going to come in this door, and we've got to embrace them as sisters and brothers in the faith. We've got to help them become part of our family. We've got to adopt them in, if that's what you want to use. We've got to encourage them, male and female, co-equals in ministry. We've got to understand their gifts, understand their abilities, and, and help them find that place in this church where they can use them. We don't want to be a church that that uh, tells people, you know, you got to wait, or you got to be better than this, or you got to be a man, or you got to be... No, we're not that. We're building a new, new uh, platform. Uh, there's a wonderful story in Africa. They built this bridge. Eight-lane bridge. Beautiful bridge. Goes over the river, right? They built it, and the flood season came, and guess what? The river moved. So now the bridge doesn't go over the river. Now the bridge leads up to the river. And so what are you going to do? You've got a wonderful bridge. It can hold cars. It can hold people. It's cement. You know, it's sturdy. You can get on it. You can't go anywhere. That's what's happened to the church. Our church, as we know it, they moved the bridge. Society moved. Young kids today, uh, Pat was saying in session, that we're a traditional church with traditional worship. A lot of young families, a lot of you know your children go to a church where you stand for two hours. I'm just too old to stand for two hours. But, and, and they worship different. But it's the same Jesus, the same God, the same fellowship. We have a place in his kingdom and a place here. And we're going to continue to look at that. Now, I, I put a little article on the front page. I hope you look at it. Our preferences. Our preferences, you know, they're all different because we grew up different. Uh, Eileen was saying to me, she wanted to get back to her roots. Presbyterian, you know. She wanted to see a guy in a robe, handsome, you know. And she's, we failed already. <laughs> we can't help it. We're just doing the best we can, you know what I'm saying. Praise God, hallelujah, for this church, for the women of this church, for the men of this church, for the leadership of this church, for the Holy Spirit that's in us, Take a look inside. Ask yourself, am I positive, productive, encouraging of others? Do I lift others up? In all that I do, in all they do, I don't listen to naysayers anymore. If someone says something negative, say, let's go talk to them. If you don't want to talk to them, I understand. Have a great day. We, we encourage each other. Male and female co Co-equals, co-workers, Priscilla and Aquilas, Pauls. Praise God, hallelujah, and amen.